Th thanks for the introduction. So I'm, I'm going to take you in these 25 minutes through some of the work we've been doing here at uh, Rocky Mountain Laboratories, which is part of like division intramural research of NIAD. Um, there we go. Um, and basically our lab studied coronaviruses before SARS-CoV-2, in particular, in particular Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus, which is, which is also a beta coronavirus, which emerged in uh, 2012. And uh, we started collaborations there. At that time, it wasn't really known the true pandemic or epidemic potential of that particular virus, uh, but it seems to be less capable of human to human transmission unless it's in a nosocomial setting. However, it was part of the WHO blueprint priority diseases uh, and together with the Oxford uh, University Jenner uh, group, we started working on chimp adenovirus uh, vaccines. And that's what's actually what I'm gonna be talking about primarily today. So in order to actually start all these kind of all these kind of like translational kind of research and preclinical development. And I think this talk kind of segues nicely from the previous talk with all the antiviral uh, efficacy studies in vitro, you actually need animal models. Um, and typically with coronavirus, it might not be that easy. For instance, uh, mouse models are typically not universally uh, susceptible unless you uh, either adapt the virus or express human ACE2. In this case, we knew from our work with SARS-CoV-1, as well as Middle East Respiratory Syndrome virus, that we had a pretty good uh, idea about which non-human primate model to use. And for both SARS-CoV-1 as Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus, we used rhesus macaques. So as soon as we got uh, our hands via collaboration with CDC, with Natalie Thornburg there, our hands on the WA1, uh, isolate, which was the first case of uh, COVID-19 in the US, we started working on this particular challenge model. And what we do there is we do a multi-route challenge in combination between uh, intranasal, intratracheal, oral, and ocular um, of a five times 10 to the 50 CID 50 per mil equates to roughly three times 10 to the six dose, challenge dose in these non-human primates. Um, so this study was set up with eight non-human primates. We challenge those animals and then we follow them over time. One uh, thing we do, we actually look at the clinical score. So twice a day, the animals get evaluated of signs of disease, uh, discomfort, um, hunched posture, breathing rate, so we can actually assess how sick these animals get. Then on scheduled uh, exam days, we follow these uh, animals throughout times. We take several samples, for instance, swabs, and in this case, like, uh, like x-ray radiographs as well. So after these challenges, we can see that all the animals uh, develop some sort of uh, clinical scores. And to put it into perspective, if we would compare it to something like Ebola, uh, the score typically tops out at 35 to 40, which is euthanasia criteria. So these animals all get like mild to moderate sickness if you would compare it to a universal lethal model. Then what we see um, showing up on the X radiographs is appearing already at day one in the lower left lobe, uh, lower right lobe, then middle and upper lobes. And we can see that all these alpagates actually start resolving over time. So this is typically what we call a transient disease. Then we move forward to looking at um, particular signs of disease as well as like virus shedding. So we take no swabs. So we see very consistent swabbing for like shedding from the upper respiratory tract until around day between day 12 and day 15, throat swabs. We see intermittent shedding from rectal swabs, no swabbing from uh, no positivity on the urogenital swabs, neither in the urine or blood. So we don't see any viremia. And we see a very good marker of lower respiratory tract virus replication when we take ball samples. 
So all together, this shedding profile actually is really reminiscent what we see in human cases, typically a transient self-limiting disease with a duration of viral RNA shedding up to, let's say, 10 to 12 days post-inoculation. So then if we look at the gross pathology, so we look at the lung, we see these lesions, lesions appearing, um, and then 21 days after inoculation, we see most of these lesions are actually already resolved, but there's still quite some lesions left. And we actually see that over here. So we can actually score the amount of lesions over, over the lungs and use that as a marker of uh, infection severity. And then if we look at the gross pathology, and I think if you appreciate here on the top part, which is a high magnif uh, low magnification view of the lungs, if we see this part of the lungs, we see these open spaces, the alveoli where the gas exchanges take place. This is what typically a lung looks like. And here we see these condensed digested, congested areas is where the active replication of SARS-CoV take place. Uh, so we actually see like, uh, pretty multifocal lesions, but not throughout the whole lungs. And then if you zoom in, we see this very classic kind of manifestations, what we typically see with coronavirus. So we see these kind of lesions with SARS-CoV-1, as well as Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus. So we see an in, influx of edema, fibrin deposits, uh, type type two hyperplasia. And if we then look at immunohistochemistry, it's the active staining of the virus. We see virus positivity in the macrophages as well as in the type one and the type two pneumocytes. So the type one and the type two pneumocytes are the cells which make up the alveoli in the lung, uh, which is where the gas exchange uh, takes place. Some of the recent follow-up studies suggest that we're actually, we're staining for, uh, nucleoprotein in these uh, macrophages. Um, and with single cell sequencing, we kind of identify that it's not active replication in these macrophages, but probably take up of infected cells is why they are staining to be positive. So in short, we now actually have a model to move forward. And if you go back over the last year, most of the preclinical development in non primate model of the vaccine used this particular rhesus macaque model. Um, so just to recap, transient moderate respiratory disease, uh, we see these pulmonary infiltrates, uh, infiltrates, which is a hallmark of COVID-19, and we see them in all the rhesus macaque in this study. We actually see quite a little bit difference between studies, uh, depending on age and also origin of the animals. Uh, we see similar shedding patterns in the rhesus macaque versus the humans, consistent with high loads from nose, intermittent shedding from throat, and in some we see rectal shedding. Uh, the histopathological changes are similar to those observed with SARS-CoV-2 and uh, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus. So we actually now have a good model to start moving forward. Um, so as soon as this particular outbreak started, we started communicating with our colleagues in the Jenner Institute in Oxford, um, which we collaborated on, on the CHADOX chimpanzee derived adenovirus, which we actually used for Middle East Respiratory Syndrome vaccine development, as well as Nipah virus vaccine development and uh, Lassa virus vaccine development. So it comprised of a replication defective adenovirus. So typically the adenovirus is used to get into the cell, gets unpacked, and then, then expresses the gene of interest, in this case, the spike. So it's the, not like the VSV vaccine platform, which is typically replication competent. So it expresses the full length, uh, let's go back, full length uh, protein. So we have all the confident conformational epitopes, uh, and the virus can infect local cells and produce high levels of protein. So typically it gives a pretty good um, humoral as well as cellular response. So making this particular virus uh, viral vector uh, vaccine, they started doing the initial testing in these BELP C mice in the Jenner Institute in Oxford. Um, so these were not challenged. Um, primarily because these animals are actually not susceptible to SARS-CoV-2. We see a very good induction of a pneumoral response here with S1 and S2 ELISA and a good neutralizing response. Uh, they actually used two different mice uh, 
mice strains, the Bell C's and the CD1. We also see a pretty good uh, splenocyte interferon response, uh, CD4 cytokines and CD8 cytokines, really showing that the vaccine induces primarily a Th1 uh, response rather than a Th2 response on the cellular level. So now we get to the rhesus macaque model, which I just talked, uh, talked about. So using this model, we vaccinated the animals with uh, two times five, 10 to the 10 virus particles. So this is like how you uh, do your vaccination studies. Um, we have three different groups. So we have a prime only. So those animals get vaccinated once. We got a prime boost. They get vaccinated at day minus 56 as well as day minus 28. And then we have a control vaccinated group where uh, the vaccine expresses GFP rather than the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2. And then we can look at the induction of the humoral response by ELISA. Again, a good humoral response and um, understandably higher after the boost. So the blue one is the prime boost group, whereas the red is the prime only group. Obviously, no induction of a humoral response with the control animals. Again, good induction of a neutralizing response, higher again in the prime boost as opposed to the prime only group. So we use the same challenge dose as we did initially when we set up the rhesus macaque model. So they got uh, in total around three times 10 to the sixth in the combination of routes. Uh, what we see is a more disease based on clinical scores in the control animals versus the vaccinated animals. If we look at the bowel fluid, so bronchial alveolar lavas, really sampling deep down in the lungs of these, both the vaccinated and the control animals, we see that the vaccine really protects well against the low respiratory tract replication of SARS-CoV-2. So we use two different assays. One is the genomic RNA, which detects all variants of uh, RNA. We also use the subgenomic RNA, which is actually a proxy of virus replication. So we hardly see any virus replication in the virus um, in the vaccinated animal, really showing that this vaccine works really well in protecting the lower respiratory tract. However, if we look at the no swabs, uh, and particularly here again, genomic RNA and subgenomic RNA, we don't really see a big difference between uh, shedding from the upper respiratory tract with the vaccinated animals versus the non-vaccinated animals, suggesting that in this particular challenge model, which is a high dose challenge by a combination of routes, the vaccine is not able to protect against upper respiratory tract replication. So if we then look at uh, replication in the lower spirit tract, so we can actually take samples up on necropsy and look at virus replication. We again see uh, very good results with vaccinated animals, like hardly any virus present, both at genomic RNA, but more importantly, subgenomic RNA. So these animals are almost completely protected against a high dose, low respiratory check challenge with SARS-CoV-2, as opposed to the control animals, again, showing that these, these vaccines are very good in protecting against severe COVID. And then if we look at histopathology, again, very similar to when we set up uh, the rhesus, initially the rhesus macaque model, we see these like multifocal lesions over here. Um, and then very typical again of SARS-CoV-2, this is again a control animal, uh, edema, fibrin deposit, these are multinucleated cells, type one and type two hyperplasia. And these kind of uh, phenomena are all absent in the vaccinated animal. Um, again, here immunohistochemistry really targeting active virus replication. So in brown, red, we see where the virus replicates. Uh, we see replication in uh, the control vaccinated animals, but none in either the prime or the prime boost vaccinated animals. So this data was actually needed for Oxford to start their uh, phase one, combined phase one and phase two clinical trials. So this is a little bit of a timeline from, uh, let's say, end of December, where the first reports came out of China till uh, 9th, of, 9th of January, where the sequence got released till we get the first isolate of the human case here at our lab at Rocky Mountain Labs, initial experiment. So once you get your virus in, you need to uh, grow your virus, go virus stop, deep sequence it to ensure that you actually don't have mutations in your viral stuff before you do your challenge and then move onward. 
Um, we shared our first data with the rhesus macaque model with WHO and all the other vaccine developments. And then we started the first vaccination already in 16th of March. And then they started their uh, clinical trial of April. So the situation now is that this vaccine has been approved in a variety of countries, uh, most importantly, UK and, uh, and India. It's um, under emergency evaluation in Europe and the larger Operation Wharf Deep clinical trials in the US are still ongoing, but I think like around 30,000 people have been enrolled in the US with this particular vaccine. So obviously we were still trying to improve this, this kind of vaccines, um, in particular because we, we show that we don't really see with a high dose challenge, uh, a reduction in shedding from the upper respiratory tract. So we were kind of thinking, well, maybe there is a way to improve this vaccination strategy. Um, and this is actually quite common if you're trying to protect upper respiratory tract viruses. And we see that typically with influenza as well. One of the reasons, of course, is that if you look at the natural infection, you would actually induce both a nasal mucosal immunity as well as a more systemic immunity. Whereas if you do the intramuscular intradermal vaccination, which is used by all of the vaccines which are now improved, including the mRNA vaccine, you generally induce a very good uh, systemic response, protecting you against severe COVID, but it might not be as efficient in protecting the upper respiratory tract, uh, what we at least saw in our uh, macaque study. So the question, of course, can we do intranasal vaccination with this vaccine platform and see whether it actually would protect the upper respiratory tract as well? So we started doing these kind of experiments uh, with another animal model. This is the hamster model. Again, very susceptible, naturally susceptible to SARS-CoV-2. Um, here we vaccinated the animals both intranasally as well as intramuscularly. Look at the ability to generate a humoral response by ELISA and a neutralizing response by uh, live virus neutralization assay. And what we see that both routes of administration of the vaccine in dense do a very good neutralizing response. However, the intranasal vaccination seemed to induce a little bit better neutralizing response over the intramuscular vaccination. So then we started challenging, um, challenging the animal, the vaccinated hamsters with, in this case, uh, the original studies we did with the Western one isolate. Obviously, there's a lot of um, virus evolution going on with SARS-CoV-2. So in this case, we started using the D614G isolate for these studies uh, to show that the vaccine will protect against these viruses as well. So this is now currently the dominant lineage. And we, of course, know that we have the UK variants and the South African variants popping up as well. Uh, these studies are still uh, in the planning phase. So both the intranasal as well as the intramuscular vaccination protect against disease. In hamsters, you get a very nice weight loss as a marker of disease severity. And then if we look at the shedding, we actually now see that uh, the intranasal vaccine is actually really able to reduce, and particularly if you look at infectious shedding, the amount of viruses shed from the upper respiratory tract, really showing that if you induce an upper respiratory tract nasal mucosal uh, response, you are better off in protecting against shedding from the upper respiratory tract. So we could actually move that a little bit more into a natural route of challenge, because obviously we use intranasal challenge with, uh, with basically you drip the virus into the nose. So the question, of course, is based on some of our other experiments showing that the route of exposure actually determines some of the disease signs as well. We were interested in seeing so how well does the virus actually work if we do a natural transmission uh, experiment. In this case, we use sentinel, we use vaccinated animals. These are the nice like brown ones and we use uh, co-house them with donor animals. So these ones get vaccinated, they got inoculated with the virus and then the vaccinated ones get exposed and see how well does the vaccine work in these kind of natural exposure systems. And it actually works quite similar uh, with again, the RNA, the intranasal uh, vaccinated animals faring better than intramuscular vaccinated animals. Um, 
And that's what we see here in the transmission as well. So these are again, the control animals with the direct challenge. These are the ones within the transmission experiment, again, showing that also under these natural exposure route, the intranasal vaccination works better from the perspective of trying to block replication in the upper respiratory tract. So obviously that only makes sense if you still are able to protect the lower respiratory tract. So initially the vaccines are of course meant to prevent severe COVID. Um, and severe COVID is basically orchestrated by virus replication and then the immune response in the lower respiratory tract. So here we nicely show that both the IN and the IM vaccination nicely protect against um, any, any replication in the lower respiratory tract. So that's really nice. Um, showing that this virus protect both the upper, this virus vaccination route both, both protect the upper and the lower replication uh, of SARS-CoV-2. However, this is of course a rodent model. So how well would this uh, route of vaccination actually work in our rhesus macaque model? So in this case, uh, we use the mad nasal syringe for vaccine administration. So basically you put that in the nostril of the animal and then uh, eject uh, uh, the syringe and it nebulizes the vaccine into the upper respiratory tract, really try to cover a large part of the, uh, the, resp the internasal respiratory tract uh, with the vaccine. We're using again the DSFIX 14G variant of this virus to really show that the vaccines currently used uh, protect against the most dominant circulating variants of this virus. And then we take nasosorption samples, which is basically trying to assess the uh, ability to um, induce a humoral response in the upper respiratory tract. So this is the data. Um, IgG serum levels, again, very nice induction by ELISA, both for the spike and the receptor binding domain of SARS-CoV-2. So the internasal vaccination works really nicely. IgA nasosorption. So these are the samples taken from the upper respiratory tract. So we now see antibodies specific for spike and receptor binding domain of spike appearing in the upper respiratory tract after vaccination, really showing that the intranasal vaccination does seem to work. And then again, a nice induction of neutralizing titus. So if you then challenge the animal models, um, and then most importantly is like looking at subgenomic and infectious virus, we see very big differences between the control animals as the vaccinated animals, really seeing a marked reduction, not a complete absence. So we still see one animal positive for virus for very low viral shedding. So it's not completely blocking, uh, but it would be blocking for around 90%. Really showing that intranasal vaccination has the ability to do that in the rhesus macaque model, confirming the results from what we showed in the hamster model. And then more importantly, if you then look at the ball samples, so the bronchial alveol of the vase, we still see a complete absence here of infectious virus in the ball samples. So again, that ability to protect both the upper respiratory tract and the lower respiratory tract. So if you would only be able to protect the upper respiratory tract, but lose that ability to protect the lower respiratory tract, then your vaccine uh, would not be as efficient, obviously. And this is what we so see with looking at the lung titers as well, upon necropsy, again, showing really nice protection here, intranasal vaccination versus the control animals and virtual absence of any virus replication in the lower, lower respiratory tract of these animals. So obviously the big question now is like, how do these vaccines, in, in this case, the AstraZeneca vaccine stack up against these novel variants? Um, either the UK variant, the South Africa variant, and now we're seeing novel variants popping up in Brazil and Japan as well. Um, uh, you have two minutes, Vincent. Thank you. This is the last, last slide, so I think it's actually pretty, pretty good timing. Perfect. Um, so what we did here is using an RBD, ELISA, so the receptor binding domain, either from the wild type RBD, or containing the mutation, the Y mutation at position 501 prevalent in both uh, 
in both the UK as well as the South African variant. And we don't see any reduction in the ability of the vaccine generated sera to recognize both of these variants, suggesting that for the AstraZeneca vaccine, it should be able to protect against the UK variant as well. However, we're getting the virus in now, so hamsters are vaccinated. We're planning to do challenge study with the UK variant in the next two, three weeks, and we're hoping to get access to the South African variant in the next couple of weeks as well to really provide protection and efficacy data of these vaccine almost in real time. Um, and with that, there's a lot of people to acknowledge, uh, in particular, Nilche, who's a staff scientist in my lab, who drove all the vaccine work in both in the hamsters as well as the research and CAG model. Um, our collaboration with the Jenner Institute, Sarah Gilbert and Tess Lam, who were really instrumental in getting and generating a very fast vaccine. And after we provided the preclinical information on vaccine efficacy, really moving with, with record speed the vaccine into phase one, two and three clinical trials. And with that, I open it up for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vincent. One, um, more, one more remark. There are postdoc positions available in the laboratory <laughs> for, for interested and prospective PhD students. So. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you a, a, a couple of questions about intramuscular versus the nasal delivery. Um, particularly, are there differences in terms of the amount of vaccine that you have to deliver um, is the nasal delivery amenable to the mRNA viruses as, uh, vaccines as well? And how is the current Oxford vaccine being delivered to um, human patients? So to start with the last, the, the current vaccine is, is IM, as are all the other vaccines, either in like Operation War Speed, so the mRNA vaccines, are intramuscularly, the uh, Chadox, AstraZeneca vaccine intramuscularly, as well as I think the Novavax uh, and the Janssen vaccine. Janssen is a different, it's a at, at 26 platform. So these are all the ones in the big clinical trials in the US. So they're all intramuscularly vaccinated. I'm not quite sure whether the mRNA vaccines are as amenable to intranasal administration or whether they would need to repackage their mRNA. Because typically you don't give, give naked mRNA, but typically it's like, like packets in some kind of micelle. Um, I'm not quite sure whether that would be, like whether you would then need to, need to redesign a vaccine delivery method. Uh, but obviously, because the Chadock vaccine is uh, is based on a common cold virus, the adenovirus, it's it's a very easy route to for this particular for this particular vaccine to add uh, to the to the repertoire. And in the in the animal studies, we use exactly the same dose as we would use for the intramuscular vaccination. 